I've made some serious mistakes as a sports card collector, flipper, and investor. And today, I'm gonna show you guys my five mistakes I made, and I hope that you guys watching this will learn from these mistakes or relate to them. My five mistakes as a collector, flipper, investor, and as a content creator. Here we go. If you're feeling vulnerable, comment down below what your mistakes are, and don't forget to like the video. If I can recommend anything from this video, I hope you become a sports card collector, because at the end of the day, money comes and goes, being a collector can be priceless. First one is going to be, I used to join breaks. That's the number one mistake I made. I personally just don't like ripping boxes and joining breaks. And I'm not tripping on anybody that does it. I burnt out. I was doing breaks and opening boxes for people back in 2009, up until I graduated high school. Too much work to host it as a business. And then I was also a consumer and buyer into it. And I learned that later on that you could just buy what you wanted and what you liked, because at the end of the day, when you bought into a break, you really didn't get your money back, which is sad to say, and it's a taboo conversation that people don't wanna talk about, but I'm bringing it up because I want you guys to learn from my mistake. Or if you enjoy breaking and you enjoy ripping boxes, it's great. For me, I enjoy ripping a hobby box or a blaster probably twice a month and I'm good. I have a choice. Would I rather spend a bunch of money on boxes and hope I pull a lottery ticket? Or I could just buy a Michael Jordan autograph or the 86 Fleer, which I've been trying to get this year. I kind of just like saving my money and buying what I like. I don't like fishing for it and I'm not a big gambler. But if that's your thing, I totally understand. This is all perspective in my experience. If you're joining the hobby and you like ripping boxes, by all means, have fun with it, but it can get really expensive. In my opinion, I think the box prices are way too high right now. A hobby box typically should be 80 to 150, and I don't think 300, 400, 500, and 1,000 above, unless it's National Treasures or Flawless or Five Star, doesn't make sense for boxes to cost thousands of dollars. I used to rip 2009 basketball before Steph Curry was even a thing, and we were chasing Blake Griffin. I watched people spend thousands of dollars on boxes chasing Zion, and they never got their return back. I experienced Lynn insanity as well and as a breaker it was amazing to pull Jeremy Lin autograph cards from from the boxes he was drafted to the Warriors and nobody knew he was gonna be that good so I've definitely been through my phases and with breaking I just have always found that if I want to buy a DeMarcus Cousins card or an Aaron Rodgers I'd like to buy those things I could gamble on a quarterback like I did Sam Howell and Desmond Ritter or I could open a box I personally like it off camera just because it's it's more fun for me just to enjoy it I like opening packs and boxes with my subscribers I love doing free giveaways with packs and boxes because it all starts with one pack. At the end of the day, 2011 Bowman draft with Bryce Harper was the first introduction to the hobby. It makes sense why, of course, I have a close relation to the 2011 Bowman. I'm not shooting down breaking and that part of the hobby. I just prefer to buy what I like and shout out to Ultimate Pastime because that is the truth. I just like buying certain things and saving my money. I think when you've been in the hobby that long, you start to realize it. I'm sure anybody in the comments will put right now that they probably got burnt out on breaking or burnt out on boxes and you just start buying what you like. It fluctuates, but once again, this isn't the end all be all. You choose how do you wanna collect, flip, or invest. Next thing, there's a misconception. People call me an influencer and I appreciate that but I still listen to other people that are influencers and actually just listen to people in the hobby. The second mistake I made was I listened to too many people in the hobby and I bought the hype. I bought Desmond Ritter, I bought Kenny Pickett, I bought Russell Wilson. I mean, back then I used to buy Anthony Bennett. I was a huge Geno Smith guy. Congrats to him on revitalizing his career, but it still counts. I was a big RG3 guy back in the day and I'm bringing, I'm dating myself back to the early, the mid 2000s. Current times, you know, I bought into John Morant. I bought into Zion. Tatis was the only player I say that I bought into and I got rid of because I just didn't have an attachment to him. And he definitely helped me develop my business. Uh, Tatis probably made me the most money out of anybody besides the card number 280 Luka Doncic rookie card. I wish I didn't buy into the hype. I wish I'd have chosen my own path and journey. Kind of what I do now, I just buy things that I think are cool. And you know, when I'm flipping and investing, I tr if I'm flipping, I need to move the cards within two weeks. There was times when I would hold the Tom Brady card or I'd hold a Mahomes card and I'd think, oh wow, this is gonna go up even further. And honestly, they both went down. I love making content and I collect sports cards. I flip and invest them. I, I guess I'll put it out there. I listen to other influencers or I listen to other people. At the end of the day, I wish that I would have made my own mind up instead of listening to the hype train um, because I got burned. Just like everybody else that's probably watching this, you probably got burned on some of those names. I got burned and it doesn't feel good to get burned. You know, and there's ways to get burned, right? I bought somebody I thought was gonna be good. I listened to somebody that said they were gonna be good. I wanna clarify, I've never told anybody what to buy. 
And in a way, if people buy something because I buy it, at the end of the day, it's your decision, right? Take this from my note. I listen to people that never told me what to buy. I just listen to their suggestions. I was at like a Dallas Card Show dinner and I was convinced Desmond Ritter was the second coming of, I don't know, Joe Namath or something. And that was wrong. Now, what I do for my research is I talk to people that follow that college and I talk to the NFL fan base of that team and hopefully they give me unbiased reaction or hopefully they give me good info. But in the, the day, I'm taking a chance just like everybody else. We all want to land the guy and I wish I didn't listen to those damn influencers. Just like all of you, I want to own the next guy. We always do. The third thing I learned and it's a personal goal for me as I've realized it just traveling the country for the last four plus years is I don't have to go to every card show. I live in LA now and I've established that I love living in Los Angeles and I've picked my battles. My schedule to my left says Sacramento, Toronto, London, Dallas, Japan. Exclusive information there. I'm not gonna go into it, but those are the next destinations. I used to go to every card show I could and it was draining. Financially, it was very tough. The content helped supply us with enough money to travel at times, but there were times when I was living on, I was staying in on the floor of hotel rooms. I was flying on Spirit Airlines. People were housing me just because I, I was traveling and trying to document the story. We're in a way different position now and I'm so grateful that I was able to build a business off this, don't get me wrong. But I was going to shows, and I don't wanna mention the cities, but I was going to shows in the middle of nowhere and we weren't getting paid, we didn't have sponsorships and we were paying for our tables and there was just shows that weren't that great. Now, when I work with a show, for example, the Toronto Sports Card Expo, the Burbank Card Show, the Dallas Card Show, and then the London Card Show, the Hobby Slam Miami Show. See, I work with them to help them promote, and in exchange, they've given me tables. I'm gonna be transparent, and it makes it worth my time. But when I go to shows and we have to pay all of our expenses, it doesn't make sense, we get burnt out. This is gonna sound really weird to you guys, but I prefer to go to shows where I know that nobody's gone. I like to try out new shows, but at the same time, there are some shows that we did go to where I thought it was a good bet in the middle of nowhere and they ended up being not very great um, and they were kind of rude to us. A lot of the content and everything else was unfolding. I think a lot of people, now they wanna be a part of it. But when we first started, I had to learn some real lessons about budgeting and traveling. And if I could do it all over again, I would go to all the shows I did in the past and all the shops, but man, it got expensive. Skip a Dallas show so you can go to the freaking National in Cleveland. I'm telling you, Budget it out. Why go to that local show and spend $50 on gas, $20 on food, unless you go to a steakhouse, $80 on food, $100. Make it a priority to pick out your shows. And that's where I get into organizing them into a Google Calendar like I've just been doing recently. And I honestly wanna share it with everybody so you guys kinda know where we're going and I'm cool with it. But I just want people to see that it's better to choose quality over quantity. So that's the third tip is I wish I wish I balanced out you know shows and shops and all the other things. The fourth thing I'm gonna say, and it's gonna be shocking to a lot of people, I wish I collected again. I wish I collected more of my PCs. I have to be honest with you, it took me until Christmas time and now moving to LA to, to, to really admire how much I love collecting my PCs. And I stopped PCing a little bit like in our third or fourth year because we were flipping a lot of cards and investing and I was picking up cool cards I liked, but in the occasional Peyton Manning signed ticket for my PC and stuff that I thought was unique, but I felt like DeMarcus, Aaron Rodgers, my Sacramento Kings, I kind of just like got kind of like, oh, I have all these cards. And I felt like in my mind, I was like, well, I kind of have most of the cards and I don't really want to spend hundreds of dollars on Rogers autographs because I see him. So I'm not going to buy those. And it just started to get a little bit boring, which is shocking, right? I got bored of collecting my favorite teams. I developed new PCs and I started to love the hobby again. When I added Kelsey Plum, it helped me watch a different sport and get into something I've never done before, which is women's sports, which honestly is crazy because it happened last year a little bit. And then Caitlin Clark and all this craziness blew up and South Carolina dominated that world. But I really stopped focusing on my PCs until Kelsey Plum and then this this is the guy and I'm gonna and he's awesome. He's part of our hobby. Josh Young. I started collecting two players that like I just gotta be honest, like I wasn't a big baseball collector until like Josh Young. I collected Reese Hoskins because we uh, grew up together, but really Josh Young and Kelsey Plum fueled me to look for new cards and see them at shows. Like I've got to tell you, Josh Young for me is the new PC that like kind of saved my my mentality on PCing someone. And also the Sacramento Kings, going back to De'Aaron Fox, and even Davion Mitchell, and our entire team just starting to get back to basics and collecting the OGs like Peja brought me back. But there's times when I wish I balanced my PC and flipping and investing in cards. Because once I lose my PC, I lose the hobby. And that's just the truth for me personally. I lose interest and I get bored. And that word bored is, is 
it sucks. It sucks to say that on this video, but it's the truth. I got so tied up into the money um, at in the third and fourth year mark of the brand, not recently, but I remember I was just like getting upset and I was like, I have my DeMarcus collection and then people were giving us cards and I just like appreciate it, but I was just like, man, I lost my love and then now it's back. And also I'd have to say DeMarcus not signing with the NBA really broke me because I was talking to his manager and his team and you know, he had an opportunity, a couple opportunities lined up and, and just for me to see him not play in the league, really like I had to grieve the fact that DeMarcus Cousins may never play NBA basketball again. That was a tough one. But now I can, I've always collected him, but I can collect my memories of him and, and I still talk to him and it's great, but it's tough when you can't watch that player anymore. And I'm sure a lot of people watching this that watched Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, Barry Bonds. I mean, geez, what a crowd to pick from. Jose Canseco, no, I'm just kidding. Buster Posey, or you watched uh, Steve Francis, or um, who are some other, Andrew McCutcheon, like random players I'm just mentioning, uh, Dan Marino, Joe Namath, when they retired, it, 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 I got emotional thinking about DeMarcus. It, it really was so hard for me because I, I had I had gotten the text that he, you know, he and I saw the article and I just was like, man, I'm never gonna get to watch him. Like, and it wasn't about money or value. It was just like, God, he's not gonna play anymore. Aaron Rodgers getting hurt really hurt my hurt me because I was like, oh my gosh, and all these people are talking all this smack and and it was just hard. It was so hard for me to to freaking process the fact that my PC players aren't playing anymore. I had to rebuild and like find new PCs and still now now I now I'll pick up every Rogers Jets card and DeMarcus Kings card but and I got and for DeMarcus it's got to be like one of ones and cool stuff for me. I wish I would have hired people to help me earlier. There were times in this brand where it was it was very tough. Like sleeping on the floors in the hotel rooms, uh, couch surfing when I was on the road was kind of tough. And it was, it was hard because I was trying to do everything myself. I used to go to shows and you'll see it in the 2020 national videos. I'm just exhausted. I'm absolutely exhausted. And, and there's a reason for that. And I, I learned this lesson and this is this fifth one. It was a lesson learned was if you can hire people to help you, or if you can act like build your team, when you build a brand, it's the best thing you can do. And I have no regrets. I hired guys to help film for me. And the reason that I want video guys isn't because I want cinematic scenes of me walking to shows. There is this organic stuff happening where I want to fully engage with the person in our content. And I, by holding a vlog style camera, it just doesn't help the interaction. And it's not about me meeting people like for recognition. It's about hearing stories from someone's first national or why they PC someone or the crazy card they have in their collection or the flip or the invest. You know, to me that that was a big thing. So when I when I wasn't hiring people such as my video guys, my editor who's editing now, it was tough. I would go to shows, I'd film all day, I'd go eat, I'd hang out at trade night, and after trade night, I'd go home and edit the videos. And there's nothing wrong with grinding, but at some level, your mental health takes a toll. Number one, I was burnt, and I don't know how I survived those moments from 15K until 30, but we did it, and it was unbelievable. And I have to shout out the people that did help, M Chief. Like when he started editing for us, it was a, it was a breakthrough. But like for example, thumbnail making, calendar, whatnot sellers, more video guys, editors. Like without that stuff, it's just really, really stressful. As a creative, I love to tell the story and create it, but at some level, I have to, I have to draw the line and say like I need help. And I try to be really defiant in my career and not ask for help and think like I have all the answers. And that was my biggest detriment in cards. The algorithm for YouTube and, and testing out thumbnails and titles and, and obsessing about it. I've caught myself complaining about videos hitting like 4,000 views. And I know someone's waking up hoping that one person comments on their video. When I was 14 years old, it would be a miracle if someone would comment on my video where I filmed on a timeless treasures box. Like, hey, I hope you had a great day, nice video. Or hey, I'm collecting, you know, back on the East Coast. Like shout out to B-Ball Champ 017 via Gallardo, two of my best friends from YouTube back in the day when we had a YouTube card community, autograph community. Like it just felt nice to have comments and replies. So like I catch myself in this, like, oh, our video only got 4,000 views. Like what the heck? Like when we were on tour and I look now at the video, I was complaining about 4,000 views has 77,000 views. And also another thing I'll say is the view count isn't reflective of who I am as a person, what the brand is, like none of that matters. It's just for performance and analytics, which I know we have to perform well, but to be real with you, like that, sh that outside validation shouldn't make me who I am. And I think this is since I moved to LA, the con and the Christmas, the Christmas content was some of my best content because it was about my PC and I let my guard down. 
Christmas up until I moved to LA, the last three, four months, I've had the most fun making content. And the tour too really taught me how to get on myself. I was a little bit stubborn and, and that's the fifth thing is like hire help and ask for help. Like in cards like if you don't know someone's gonna be good ask somebody like if you if a content if you think your video if you want honest opinions ask people what they think of your thumbnail your title your 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 video content i send my videos to random people who don't watch cards to see what they think and they they and they destroy it they destroy my videos and and i love it because they don't collect cards they think we're crazy but we're so passionate and I, I let it happen so my fifth tool might be a little like unique but maybe someone will relate to this is like when you're making content or you're trying to buy cards ask for help we all start with i don't know all right and i just felt like i was very stubborn i had people try to help me multiple times and i picked it up it takes me like it takes me a decent amount of time like i say i'm a sponge but there's times when i think i know something and that's defiance it probably comes from being persian and my dad which i love my dad he's a great man but man i needed to learn the hard way like it's not about shows it's in silence like i'm just like people are trying to help me and i'm just like no no i i can do this and and I have and I have to start saying I can do this I leave you all with this I made these five mistakes I learned some I learned some lessons from them, and there's some things that I still need to work on like that fifth one talking about like YouTube content and asking for help I'm trying to outsource more like we have had whatnot streamers we have editors we have video guys I'm actually bringing on a couple people to work on scheduling and help us get like more sponsorships and that's been great but you know, if any of those five things that you, hopefully they helped you in any way, I hope that my mistakes can be lessons that people can learn because at the end of the day, we're not, you're never gonna do this thing 100% right. You're never gonna be the guru of sports cards. You're not gonna be the best content creator. You're not gonna be the best flipper investor. None of that matters. Just like, at the end of the day, like enjoy the hobby, like enjoy the flipping and the enjoy the economics and the business side of it and enjoy being a collector and priceless and share the memories with your friends and family. Like there's a good balance there that can happen. And I highly recommend anybody watching this video, like if you related to this on any level, like comment down below and like, let's have a conversation about it. Why do I always ask for likes, comments, subscribe? to me it's build community and engagement like i love i spend hours a day on youtube studying and commenting back and replying so i like to interact with the community it's a community and that's that's what we should be doing those are my five mistakes i uh, hope it helped also shout out our whatnot guys i'm gonna be live high powered lives like two times a week use my invite link down below you'll get your ten dollars to spend on whatnot on me which i love i don't own a card shop but i stream on whatnot and i love it and it's my online card shop so you guys got to check it out i mean come on you guys you guys always ask me if i'm opening a card shop just come hang out online it's the best place to be and lastly if you need the beautiful zion case this is the one i'm using zion case xl it's pretty good for shows and travel. I would never check this on an airplane if you're watching this. Use the code MOJO10 for your Zion cases and you'll get a little discount on me? Yeah, me. I know this sounds crazy. I love you guys. If you're watching this, it's all love. And I appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you guys for the next video. Peace.